Welcome back to How to Stan, the podcast all about both specific fandoms and fan culture as a whole. Today's theme is The Simpsons and why it still has such loyal viewership all these decades later. What makes The Simpsons stand out as a cartoon? Why does it deserve the fandom that it has? And the perfect guests to talk about this with are who I talked to on the show today, Dr. Karma Waltonen and Denise DuVernay. They are teachers and authors who have incorporated regularly The Simpsons episodes and themes into their classroom curriculum, and they've actually created actual coursework that is drawing from Simpsons inspirations, and we will get into all that in this interview and much more about the, the very impressive and sharp insights into our own society that we get through the parodied version of Simpsons content. It's an interesting mirror of society, the way that Simpsons episodes play out. And so they wrote books on that. The first book they wrote together was called The Simpsons in the Classroom and Beginning the Learning Experience with the Wisdom of Springfield. And just last year, their essays that were part of a compilation were published in a compilation titled The Simpsons' Beloved Springfield, Essays on the TV Series in Town That Are a Part of Us All. So to better understand the depth of meaning and intrigue regarding this cartoon family, stay tuned for this interview. If you could start out, um, either one of you could start uh, with answering my first question about kind of just the origin story of the idea and how that whole book came about and also kind of like your both of your stories of like how you became a Simpsons fan in the first place. The book came about because, well, when Karma and I met at Florida State University and we, um, Karma was a year ahead of me in the graduate program and she taught a course on writing about the Simpsons the year before I did at Florida State in the writing program um, to get a master's degree. It was a requirement, I don't know if it still is, to teach or to create, not necessarily to teach, but to create a special topics writing course. Uh, we're gonna, I'm going to give away our age a little bit here, but it was the late 90s and um, The Simpsons was a very popular show. And I, I can't speak for karma, but I knew that um, I really enjoyed the show and I knew that I could really help students um, to understand the writing prompts and to to not be so intimidated by the writing assignments if I was using something that was um, approachable and entertaining and everybody loved The Simpsons. So, and I loved teaching writing, but found that a lot of students hated writing or were nervous about writing. So using something that everyone really enjoyed, like The Simpsons, to break through to them seemed to be a logical thing. So um, after after this course, Karma and I, Karma to a much greater extent, um, taught various courses using The Simpsons, sometimes entirely on The Simpsons. And eventually we thought, hey, let's put this into a book because using pop culture in the classroom is just a, a wonderful way to reach students and to help them understand concepts about um, writing and um, about literature about politics, about religion, about everything. The Simpsons is just a rich treasure trove of all topics, particularly related to American culture. I think part of part of that first book too, though, came from the fact that you and I were both sometimes having to defend ourselves to people. We kept saying, well, how could you use this in the classroom? What do you mean this is how, you know, the, the student who told me that her dad said my class on The Simpsons was what was wrong with America, you know, (laughs) these sort of weird slings and arrows. But, you know, a lot of that was coming from a fundamental misunderstanding, of course, about the show and that the people who said that tended to think this was a kid's show. We weren't just watching TV and talking about TV. We were we were using The Simpsons to teach other (laughs) topics as well. Well, we weren't exactly just like saying, okay, today we're going to talk about Bart. It is used a lot in classrooms, I think. And there's more than meets the eye at first with that show. The class curriculum you created about the show of The Simpsons uh, can be used to teach politics or religion or et cetera, et cetera. Is that kind of how it's structured? That's the way that I do my class most often. 
Um, and of course, that's when I have a class that's focused specifically on The Simpsons as opposed to just bringing The Simpsons in to help with another topic. Um, so yeah, so what I what I'm teaching now when I do it is a freshman seminar. So it gets to be a small class, and we get to to all participate, which is the best thing about seminars. Um, but yeah, that we have. A sort of theme each week and we're just meeting once a week but that theme we're digging in and for example the way if we're looking at religion the way that the simpsons is representing religion the way that they're looking at how religion exists in our lives like right now the simpsons is still showing us a world in which most children are going to sunday school on sundays and i don't know that that's true anymore it was much more common when i was a kid for that to at least be the expectation that your family would be doing that. But we can also talk about how things have changed that way. We're looking at things thematically through and then their final project, and they can do this collaboratively, is to write a mini script. And that really drives home to them how hard it is to write comedy. <laughs> And how hard it is to be original. So sometimes I say, well, if you're trying to think of something that they've never done, just regular plot wise, it's really hard to do that. I said, but you know, you can always do a, you know, Simpsons are going to this place episode. I'm out here at the University of California, Davis, and I had one group do the Simpsons going to Davis. And it was fun because it was, you know, just all the Davis stereotypes. But, you know, once they have that plot, it is really hard. They discover not just to tell the story, but to tell the story in a funny way. And they always tell me that they really appreciate not just The Simpsons, but of course, any good writing, you know, that they're listening to on a podcast or whatever it is, once they realize how much effort actually goes into it, how much revision is needed. Are they sort of supposed to like just work with uh, the Simpsons characters or is it more about taking like themes about how they apply humor? Um, they are supposed to be creating, you know, a Simpsons mini episode. It, it can even be a little Halloween vignette. But one of the rules I do have is that they can't have the characters go out of character without explaining it. Like I had one student in my very first Simpsons class who... From the way he smelled and the way his eyes looked and everything else, I think he was high every single day. And he created a script where just every single character was high. But, like, doesn't make sense. It's not funny, you know, because the only joke is the baby's high. You know, I even told him, if, if you explained it, any yeah. attempt to even explain how the baby would have gotten marijuana in her system so you know sometimes there are problems like that and and sometimes they do like the when i'm working with them to sort of polish the script sometimes for example they'll have pushed back at mr burns and i'll remind them it takes a lot for smithers to tell mr burns no he has to yeah. block out the sun you know, it can't yeah. just be insulting a worker. <laughs> so sometimes yeah. it's about, no, you really, you really have to try to inhabit that character to make it work. I have not had the chance to teach a full Simpsons class in the exact way that Karma has. But one thing that I was able to do is teach a literature course where the entire syllabus was inspired by The Simpsons. I informally called it Simpsons Did It or Simpsons Already Did It or whatever, mm -hmm. like based on the, the, the South Park episode. Read Streetcar. We read um, some poems of Pablo Neruda. We read some Shakespeare. I didn't actually tell them right off the bat that everything was from The Simpsons. And the idea was kind of that pop culture should make you smarter. Pop culture should give you something. It shouldn't just be a dad punching his daughter in the head for no reason, right? Karma and I talk about a lot is mm -hmm. how we find Seth MacFarlane fairly dreamy, but we don't understand his shows. We understand his shows. We don't understand the appeal of his shows, I guess. I was particularly charmed by, by, by my ability to take a throwaway line in one episode, Bart Sells His Soul, and turn it into like a two-week section on... Um, on the poems of Pablo Neruda, but that's what I did. It really is such a layered show. So much there, even if it seems like a simple premise, like it's a show about a town and, you know, it's hard to explain, but it really does have a lot to it. Right. And there were, there were, there are times when, well, when I was 
living at at home when the show first started when I was very young and and there would be jokes and this was before Wikipedia or Google or whatever or before I had a computer in the palm of my hand and there would be a joke and my dad would laugh and I would be like I I don't get it and then he would have to explain to me like you know who Rory Calhoun was or who Stephen Eady were you know because I would have no idea I also wouldn't know what a lemon party was if it weren't for the Simpsons so (laughs) You give a little, you get a little. They start conversations for sure. (laughs) My next question is kind of less of a question and more, I guess, just I'm curious what your thoughts are. How The Simpsons is so effective at using humor? Because it seems like is all kind of in some ways ironic or satirical towards our own society, but it's not in a way that makes you feel offensive and like you just want to turn off the TV, making fun of people without turning them off. And I just think that's a unique way to still like call out society through humor. I, I was just curious how you would explain what they do so well with the way they have social commentary. Catherine O'Hara from Schitt's Creek was saying you know, that on their show, they don't have to actually do overt sociopolitical commentary, she said, because, you know, people are laughing because it's a comedy show. And then they happen to see these relationships that they're opening themselves up to. And she, she said something like, you know, once you have them laughing, that's how you get them to open their hearts and their minds. And of course, The Simpsons has them laughing with the very pointed satire. A lot of us don't always feel like they're making fun of us, right? We think they're making fun of the neighbors. No, they're making fun of America and we're part of that group, but we believe that we're like the good part of America. I think sometimes there can just be that cognitive dissonance where you might see something about yourself portrayed on the show, but you can be convinced it's it's not about you. And a lot of people never did connect with it. My grandmother after seeing the very first episode, said it was horrible and it was immoral and she never watched it again or, you know, understood what I was doing uh, with it all those years later uh, when I was interacting, you know, with it in a more academic way. Um, But, you know, the things that satirize us have have always been pretty powerful and moving. You know, the, the Smother Brothers comedy show, which got taken off the air the same year it won the writing award. But it got taken off the air basically because it was pissing the president off for critiquing the Vietnam War and things. And so you had a public, most of whom were really responding, though, to the satire and to the humor, the political humor on the show. Uh, But then, of course, you had another segment of of that audience, like my grandmother, again, who never forgave them uh, for Christmas. Facing that war. Uh, so we we do respond to that. You know, Saturday Night Live has been satirizing politics since 1975. They are as old as I am. Uh, the Simpsons was just, it's not the first show to do some some satire, but I, I think that because it's a cartoon sitcom and therefore we can pull out into the larger world, so we can cut to the mayor we can cut to the president. We don't have to build whole new sets. To be, it just broadened it up. I, I feel like some of the some of the satires, like the stuff with Archie Bunker, like it, it was still pretty much the family and a particular type of a particular type of family. And then The Simpsons just allowed us to have the whole country and the whole world. You can just associate more if it is a mm-hmm. cartoon. So that makes sense. Uh, Denise, did you have anything to add to that thought about using humor and how it's effective about it? Um, the only thing I would add is that I do think that people do get bent out of shape about it. People get frustrated at the Fox jokes and it, whoever the president is at the time, the Simpsons will poke fun at. But whoever, the mm-hmm. whichever party is it is at the time, the audience forgets that, that the Simpsons pokes fun at whoever is president. So they think <laughs> they think that that they're being unfair, right? They, they think they're being unfair to the current president, but mm-hmm. they're not. They, they poked fun at Clinton quite a bit. It was it Bill O'Reilly who famously called the writers pinheads? Um, oh, I think so. 
Yeah, it was. It was. Oh, I, I, I think it was Bill O'Reilly. It was like one of the Fox people, colleagues, you know, in another part of the company because they were part of the same company at the time. Um, pinheads, and uh, there has been some critique about the show, but yes, in general, the general public does does allow a humorous critique more than you know a straight critique. Back in 2006, I was at a play in London, and the man sitting beside me before the curtain went up, you know, was asking what I did and, you know, asked me what kinds of things I taught. And I told him, and he said that The Simpsons was this amazing satire of America, and it's too bad Americans wouldn't get it. It was too smart. So you think a show made for an American audience that's intentionally a satire and that's written by American writers, you think none of us get it? And he really thought that. He thought that we didn't get it, that it was making fun of us. You can find people from all over mm -hmm. the world who know about it. I was reading, it's called uh, The Simpsons, A Cultural History. It's, I think it's just an essay, not a full book, but... Anyway, it's um it talks about this uh, this guy who uh, was on this train ride and he was with a couple other people from different continents and they were all just going I think to the same university or something. He somehow found a way to explain or understand the situation that they were trying to talk about because he used the monorail Simpsons episode as like the metaphor. And they all knew about the monorail episode so they all knew exactly what he was talking about. I just thought that was a really interesting example of how the commentary is really like a parody of America, but it's also can be used materialism jokes or the author jokes about authority figures or just any of the satire. Like that could be pretty applicable. Mm -hmm. anyway. Yeah, I mean, th there are some stereotypes that are unique to us, but it's they're not dealing with those in most of the shows. And, you know, usually when they come up, it's because they're visiting yeah. another country and then you have, you know, Homer you know, wearing a, a shirt with Uncle Sam taking a bite out of the globe. And yeah, not every country would have a stereotype about themselves wearing that kind of shirt. But all the other stuff is just everybody, as you said, you know, has problems with certain authority figures. I'm sure you can make fun of some elementary school principals in the same way, no matter what country you're in. I've been thinking about um, lately, like, which characters on the simpsons are like most misunderstood in a way or like actually secretly have more depth to them than people realize represent more than they seem on the surface i was talking to someone the other day about favorite simpsons characters um and she said that barney is actually pretty symbolizes a lot more than just like he's that drunk character you know like the uh, dreams that you can't fulfill in society or whatever but i was just curious a certain character on the show that's either your favorite or just one you think deserves more attention as you were asking the question i was thinking about when homer tries to lighten the fact that apu cheated on his wife and like he's he's trying to be like i know how we can make this okay i know how we can make this funny and so he tells crusty and Krusty doesn't make a joke at all. He's just, he sounds heartbroken. And he says, that's so sad. That poor couple, they have all of those kids and what's going to happen to them. And right, and of course, that is about, you know, it, it's this self-referential moment where they're doing exactly what we're trying to do here, which is recognizing that not all of these characters are just stock characters we're always going to react with the joke. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of the characters, and again, it's because we get to see into their world so much, but, but also because it's been so long running that we've been able to see into their private lives. Like where you mentioned Barney and we're still sort of watching Barney struggle with sobriety sometimes. Um, mm -hmm. And in, in the episode where he makes his wonderful movie, right, the unfortunately titled Pucahontas. <laughs> so so we, we get to see into his soul and to recognize that he knows how absurd his drinking problem is from the outside. Um, and, and now, 
you know, we, we, we sometimes see him back at the bar and it's because he's relapsed and that's just, that's realistic. Um, so I think a lot of the side characters have depth that is unappreciated. I mean, it's, it's one of the challenges with what we're going to do with a poo now, because, you know, whether there's going to be another actor who does him or whether he just doesn't speak anymore. Uh, I, I hope that he doesn't just fade into the background with no lines anymore because we've learned so much about him, right? He's not just some convenience store owner. He feels very right. real to me. <laughs> and I wouldn't want to lose him. Well, and it's not just his role as a worker too. He's a father mm -hmm. and everything. And he has a He's... sense of humor himself, which I love. I think um, discounting him as a stereotype is not fair. He he is more mm -hmm. more interesting than just um, the stereotype of the convenience store owner. You know, I also think there's a lot to disco stew. <laughs> there's oh, got to yeah. be. There's got to be. What happened to disco stew that makes him cling to the seventies so? <laughs> And of course, there's there's um, Millhouse. I mean, Millhouse. What a what a a, a, a tortured soul is Millhouse. He seems like Bart's yeah. sidekick, but you know the unrequited love for Lisa, the 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 broken home, yeah. and then the unbroken home, and and <laughs> he knows what it feels like when doves cry. I mean, there's. <laughs> More of my conversation with Karma and Denise after this quick break. What is a personal favorite episode of The Simpsons of yours, either just because you like it or because you like to use it a lot in the classroom and find it to be layered in its messages and just a good teaching tool to use? Well, for me, since we're talking about a poo, um, much a poo about nothing, the episode where he's almost deported um, has has it works on so many levels and it's timeless um where you know the the mayor wants to blame somebody so he picks undocumented immigrants to springfield for the reason why the bear why there's a bear tax right even though it's obviously and then um the the immigration test you know that 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 lisa is the only person who could possibly pass it except a poo who knows everything already before he even studies Homer's ninth grade history notes because he appreciates and respects America and American history so much. Um, and he deserves to be there because he came there to get his PhD, you know? <laughs> There's so much to that episode. Um, I think it's brilliant from beginning to end. And I've, I've used it in class numerous times, um, regardless of who is president, BTW. Yeah, I use that one a lot. When I'm talking about politics, I always do the much of poo about nothing. But if it's just I want to start them with a really strong episode, I'll either do one of the earlier ones that they probably haven't seen, or I'll go just a couple years forward and go to Lemon of Troy, where the lemon tree gets stolen. And it's it's also beautifully written from beginning to end. I think one of my favorite callbacks in the entire 30 plus years of the show is when Bart has to try to figure out Roman numerals. And he said, they didn't even try to teach us that at school, but we literally saw them trying to teach the kids there. And, and I think that one of the things I really love about that episode, it captures the way a kid's mind thinks. You know, it's a kid-centered episode, but you see mm -hmm. a couple times them making assumptions about things, them imagining things. So, like, Bart believes that by writing his name in cement, that that's going to be a good thing, that he'll be remembered. Of course, that's not true, but that's how a little kid thinks. Or us thinking his camouflage yeah. is really going to work. It's absolutely ridiculous. Or Bart just assuming he could read lips. Or that he thinks that yeah. he's famous in the other town. Yeah. It is I, Bart. So who? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's beautiful. And of course, it it is an episode that you can, and I've used it for a bunch of different things, but um, you can think about, of course, the town rivalry as metaphor for any rivalry, right? It's You can mm -hmm. do international politics that way. 
kind of thing. And of course, the, the towns are pretty much the same, but they hate each other for no good reason. You've got a lot of, and I've used this for when we critique gender roles and stuff, I've had students realize that the gender roles are fairly old fashioned in that episode, that it's the boys who are sort of getting in trouble and it's all the dads who go find the boys. On the other side, you can see that as a critique because the girls are flying kites and not getting into this, you know, town rivalry BS. They're right. They're jumping over the border. No problem. Um, and of course the things that the men are doing are not always smart, right? It's, it's actually Bart who has the smartest idea mm -hmm. <laughs> I get the tree back and he's a little boy. So, I mean, the episodes are really fruitful because if you then ask the students, okay, so is this episode encouraging us to adhere to those old gender roles or is it critiquing them? There's a healthy debate there. And an interesting fact about that episode, it is so fascinating that it inspired the name of our second book. Mm -hmm. I was going to bring that up about how the cover and everything mm -hmm. is from that episode. That brings me to my next question. Is uh, Could you talk uh, more now about the essay compilation that came out last year about um, the town of Springfield and what inspired that essay collection and what you contributed to it? There were some things where the scholarship was still a little light. I mean, and there still are. It's not like we filled every possible gap. We definitely did it. But, you know, one of the mm -hmm. things that we have in the first book is a bibliography, basically, about the Simpson scholarship that's out there. And in compiling that and keeping things like that updated just for ourselves in our notes and from teaching the class and sort of wanting an article about X, Y, or Z that would go along with it, you know, you start to go, oh, wouldn't it be great if there were an article out there about this or an article out there about this other thing. So my essay in the book, besides the introduction that we co-wrote, is on sex. And there are articles out there about representations of men and women. And there are articles out there about the sort of heterosexual versus homosexual, just that oversimplistic way of looking at sexuality, in you know, which wasn't, which was groundbreaking at the time. The right, Simpsons the was doing binary. very groundbreaking work at the time. I'm not, mm -hmm. I'm not dismissing that at all. But, um, you know, we have more lenses and more ways of talking about it. So uh, in my class, I pick the first few weekly topics, but then I let the students pick the topics for the weeks afterward. When I let them do that anonymously, the number one topic they want to talk about is sex. Uh, it has to be anonymous because they don't want to raise their hands for that. They're adorable. Uh, but of course, that meant, well, we have to talk about what that means. And so a lot of that article just comes out of me in the class talking with them about even just what that means. Because when you say, I want to talk about sex, are you saying you want to talk about the sex act? Or are you saying you want to talk about kink? Or are you saying you want to talk about the sexuality spectrum, or are you saying you want to talk about the sex gender spectrum? Or you know, like, there's so many ways. And then of course there's consent yeah. and there's, you know, all of these other things that are part of that. The now, of course, when we talk about it, I have them read the article and then we build on those ideas. There's always something that the Simpsons can add to the conversation and then always something where there's probably another article to be written about any any given aspect of the show. I love going to different conferences, you know, conferences where it just doesn't necessarily even make sense at first that I would be talking about The Simpsons there. So recently I went to a conference for the Utopian Studies Association. I was talking about The Simpsons as a utopia in terms of civic engagement. You know, The Simpsons shows something that's super unrealistic, and that is a town that goes to every damn town hall meeting. All the parents are always at the PTA meetings. They're everywhere all the time. I don't think I use the word utopia, but they're good people. They're civically engaged. And it's supposed to be kind of a microcosm, but it's supposed to be kind of this idealized town of 
civically engaged people who do go to all of the events, who go to, they all go to elementary school <laughs> band concerts. I feel like your chapter mm -hmm. takes it in, in another direction too, where of course you talk about the other side of that. There is a dark side to civic participation if they all become a mob. Right, exactly, that, that there's danger in that. They're not all capable of critical thinking. They're very easily capable of being convinced to do to do foolish things or to, to vote no on or to vote yes on 24 right we want them to vote no on it they vote yes on it that's part of the satire of the show right if we're too easily convinced by the mob rule by the loudest voice by the catchiest song convincing us to shut down the maison derriere or the we're here we're queer we mm -hmm. don't want any more bears chant <laughs> right <laughs> I mean they're chanting words that make no sense but they it's catchy so they say it That that's kind of I don't know that summary of what they do just made me think of that whole even at Niaj thing uh... and when they like sing the words backwards <laughs> I just got a flash of that mm -hmm. um, they don't know what they're singing but they're singing it Lisa anyway Lisa figures it out my last question is about, um, because The Simpsons has um, withstood the test of time, it's been around for decades now, do you see The Simpsons as, like, quality-wise and, like, depth-wise? Like, is it, does it seem to be getting old, or are they continuing to put out just very impressive episodes that are still the same tier they always were? Do the lessons from it seem relevant still? Like, what does the future look like for the show Do you, as you see it? I don't think the show is in decline, but I think that the audience is different now. I mm -hmm. think that it feels sometimes like it might be sailor, but we're forgetting that we as an audience have such different expectations. You know, the things that The Simpsons did that were really upsetting my grandmother and making people write letters about how it was too subversive. Like what my grandmother objected to was that Bart called his father Homer. That's it. Yeah, that was what it was. And The Simpsons, of course, has grown with us in that, you know, <laughs> there are plenty more things to be offended by. Uh, <laughs> but but The Simpsons is never going to be Archer. Yeah. You know, <laughs> it's not going to push the envelope into this strange place because mm -hmm. then it wouldn't be The Simpsons anymore. And so we don't find it as shocking anymore. We don't find it as satirical anymore, but that's just because we have changed and because so many other shows have come up sort of writing The Simpsons tales. You know, like when I'm teaching this show to my students who've all grown up and I'm and I try to explain to them what the world was like before. I actually have them interview someone from the time before The Simpsons. And one of my students called his mother a liar when she said there were only a few channels. My mom lied. Oh. And, said, and I'm like, your mom did not let you call your mother back right after class. But I tried to remind <laughs> the kids, I said, you know, The Simpsons, like imagine sitting down with your grandma and watching Archer. <laughs> and they're like, oh, I would never do that. That's so scary. And I'm like, okay, so my grandmother hated The Simpsons the way your grandmother might hate Archer. And then I always tell the kids, now remember that your grandkids are going to watch something that's going to freak you out that much. Try to imagine what it's going to be. And of course we can't. And, and just doing that thought exercise, they go, yeah. oh, right. It's the audience that's changed. It's our expectation. We're not shocked by early Simpsons or late Simpsons now because we're a more sophisticated, more raunchy, more everything audience now. Karma and I have had this conversation before, which is why I asked her to, to take the stab at it because I knew that how we um, have communicated about this in the past, that people want to be shocked and they're disappointed when they're not. And The Simpsons can't possibly shock you. That's why they, that's why people continuously insist that the Simpsons have made predictions that they haven't because they want so badly for the Simpsons to shock us and awe <laughs> us. Like, no, the Simpsons did not predict 9-11. The Simpsons did not predict the Donald Trump presidency. Some of that is just time too. Like when my students say they made an Ebola joke and mm -hmm. then, you know, years later we had an Ebola outbreak. 
didn't they predict Ebola? And I said, but you realize they couldn't have made that joke if we hadn't already had an Ebola outbreak. You realize that joke would have made no sense. Yeah. <laughs> said it obviously had to exist before the <laughs> joke for them to joke about it you know if if you have to pick who's gonna be playing a game on this show you know you'll pick two teams that exist and at some point in 30 years they're probably gonna play each other it's decades that that they've been putting sports teams <laughs> to play each other that show for homer to watch we are running out of time now but um thank you both so much for taking the time thank you. any final thoughts about the show or anything else you want to say you can follow us on twitter and facebook at simpsonology and then both denise and i have other social media accounts as well we're always up for talking with fellow simpsons lovers about the show Thanks again to Dr. Karma Walton and Denise DuVernay for joining me on the show today. Again, their books are called The Simpsons in the Classroom and The Simpsons' Beloved Springfield, essays on the TV series and town that are a part of us all. And again, you can also check them out on social media at Simpsonology and continue the conversation among Simpsons superfans. Next week, I do not have a new episode of How to Stand. I will be taking a week off, but the Sunday after that, I will be back but there's no week off for 17 karat K-pop, so expect more of that from me this week. So talk to you all soon, and thank you for listening.